Stephen Pribble, pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Brian Schwertley of Reformation Fellowship Reformed Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Reformation Forum, where we relate the unchanging truth of Scripture to present day realities. And tonight's subject is the Kingdom of God. We have been speaking about this over the last several programs, and we're presenting a little different view of the Kingdom than you're going to hear in uh, many fundamental and uh, evangelical churches today. And uh, we want to back up everything that we say from the Scriptures. It is our desire on this program to uh, correctly interpret and apply the Holy Scriptures. Brian, do the Old Testament kingdom prophecies predict a literal, earthly, Israelitish kingdom that's going to take place in the future? No, they don't, Stephen, and there are several very bad problems with that idea. First of all, God only has one people. God does not have two peoples. Now, dispensationalism, one of their foundation stones is the idea that God has two peoples, Israel and the church. And that is simply not true. God is not a polygamist. God has one bride, the church. He does not have two brides. He does not have two wives. God is not a polygamist. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, that Christ has one body and not two. And then in Ephesians 2, 14, it says the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has been broken down. And then it says in Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, that God is building both Jewish and Gentile believers into one temple. See, God only has one people, the church. And Jews and Gentiles belong to the church. If you are Jew and you believe in Jesus Christ, you belong to the church of Christ. So that's one problem right there. God does not have two peoples. God only has one people. Now, another problem is that we are told specifically not to rule from a literal Jerusalem. Listen to this. This is Hebrews 13, 12 to 14. Jesus suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. For here, that is on earth, we have no continuing, ci no continuing city, but we look... We seek the one to come. See, God tells us, don't look for an earthly Jerusalem. Don't look for a literal Jewish kingdom. Look for a heavenly kingdom. We look to the Jerusalem above. And then it says in Hebrews 12, 22 to 23, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Okay, the church is the new Jerusalem. We don't look for a literal earthly Jerusalem, a literal earthly reign, a heavenly Jerusalem. And then it says in Galatians 4, 24 and 25, the Jerusalem which now is, okay, this is when this was written, when Paul was alive, the Jerusalem which now is, is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Paul says we don't look to the earthly Jerusalem. We look to a heavenly Jerusalem. And then Paul says in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And then Jesus told the woman of Samaria, remember the woman at the well? He told her, he said, look, a time is coming when Jerusalem is going to lose its special significance. It's not going to be special anymore. Listen to this. This is from John 4.21-23. Women, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, that temple, that curtain in the temple was rent in half, and that Jerusalem worship is no longer significant. We worship now through Jesus Christ, who is the true temple. That, was, that old temple was a type. We worship through Christ, so that loses its significance. And then the problem of the rebuilt temple. Okay, is there going to be a literal rebuilt temple? No, there is not. There is not going to be a literal rebuilt temple. Those prophecies refer to the church of Jesus Christ. This is from Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 
God is taking both Jews and Gentiles that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and building the temple of God. Very, very clear. And a passage that really proves that. Listen to this. This is from Acts 15, 14 to 17. This passage absolutely proves that the church is the temple of God. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the Gentiles being converted to Christ, and with this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, after this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. He says specifically, he refers to a prophecy in Amos, he says this prophecy is being fulfilled by God building the church from the Gentiles. Hmm. That is the fulfillment of the tabernacle of David being rebuilt, the church of Jesus Christ. And then the, one of the greatest arguments against this dispensational idea of a literal kingdom, it, is in, it involves the Jews... Okay, Christ comes back, they say, and he establishes a literal kingdom. You're going to have a literal rebuilt temple, and you're going to have sacrifices in that temple. People, that is unbiblical. It is unbiblical. Once Jesus Christ came, those sacrifices, which are types that look forward to Christ, he did away with that. Christ did away with the literal temple. He did away with the sacrifices. And if you believe that the Jews are going to have sacrifices, they're engaging in something that's sinful, wicked behavior because Christ has put that away. Very, very clear. And it says in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 45, 15, and this is a prophecy of the, that they say refers to the millennium, the literal millennium when Christ rules from Jerusalem. And the word used there is kafar, which is make atonement. Okay, it says literally that atonement is going to be made. They say these are memorial sacrifices. And the Bible says literally that it says make atonement. So this prophecy cannot be used to speak of a literal rebuilding of the temple. It just cannot be done. You know, Stephen... Are all the events described in the book of Revelation yet to take place in the future, or have some of those already taken place? It's very important to understand this question, Brian. Just listen to the opening words of the book of Revelation, and try to listen with an open mind. Just let John uh, report to us exactly what the Lord told him. It says in Revelation 1, verses 1 through 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Listen to what John says. He's speaking about things which would shortly take place, and he says the time is at hand. The events are just about ready to take place. People, John was writing just immediately prior to the destruction of the temple, uh, which took place during the great tribulation that Jesus spoke about, that time when because uh, the Jews rejected his kingdom, he was going to personally come and destroy the temple and the city of Jerusalem, and that took place in A.D. 67 to 70. John was written, or uh, John and also the book of Revelation were written just prior to that time. And the reason that he wrote the book of Revelation was to comfort uh, saints that were going to go through a time of persecution and to assure them that if they remain true, the Lord was going to deliver them and the Lord was going to comfort them. Now, what kind of comfort would it have been for John to have said, by the way, uh, I'm going to tell you some things that are going to take place 2,000 years from now, or at least 2,000 years from now. That wouldn't have been any comfort at all. But John wrote, and he said he was telling about things that would shortly come to pass. He said, the time is at hand. Then again, uh, the book of Revelation ends where it says, um, the Lord God sent his angel to show his ser uh, servants the things which must shortly take place. And uh, the Lord says again, I am coming quickly. He says that five times in the book of Revelation. And so the book of Revelation is speaking about things that were going to take place very soon. Now, I'd like to bring in just one other little piece of evidence before I give the rest of the answer to this question. And that is the Olivet Discourse, which 
parallels the book of Revelation in many things. It speaks about the destruction of the temple, and in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew records the Lord Jesus Christ saying, these are Christ's words, he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And in the Bible, a generation is generally considered to be 40 years. He was writing those, th or he, he spoke those things around 30 AD, and by 70 AD, exactly 40 years later, uh, the, the temple was destroyed, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, Judaism was finished as a religion, uh, the, the temple service came to an end, the sacrifices came to an end, the priesthood came to an end, all the genealogical records came to an end, uh, the, the religion was uh, as, as it was known in the time of the Old Testament, it was completely finished. And I could develop this more. I could go into the book of Hebrews where it says that uh, the sacrifices were continuing, but they were about ready to end. Uh, but anyway, there are things in the book of Revelation that are yet future. Much of the book of Revelation, contrary to what you are often taught by a lot of well-meaning dispensationalist teachers, much of the book of Revelation has already, uh, already taken place. It's already occurred. But we believe that Jesus Christ is coming again in his second coming. That is still future, and there are events in the book of Revelation which are yet future. Related to this idea, Brian, and just before I ask you the question, let me remind our viewers, please, if you haven't already in an earlier program, pick up the phone and give us a call. Call either Brian or myself, either of the numbers that you see on the screen, and we'll be happy to send you a copy of uh, this book that we have just recently co collaborated on. It is called the uh, the premillennial deception. You need to read this. You need to understand what the Bible is saying about these things, and you're not going to hear this in a lot of pulpits, and we're going to be able to go into a lot more detail in the book than we can do on this program. Brian, a lot of people have the idea that the kingdom is exclusively Jewish. We've talked about uh, uh, Christ coming to set up a dictatorship. Is the kingdom of Christ exclusively Jewish, or are Gentiles also included in it? The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, is pan-ethnic. That means it's for all peoples over the whole earth. And the Bible is crystal clear about this. It just amazes me that people could believe in this Jewish kingdom concept. Turn with me, if you have a Bible, uh, or write this down. This is Galatians 3, 28 and 29. This is what Paul says. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. If you believe in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're Chinese, Japanese, African, Italian. Paul says you're a true Jew if you believe in Jesus Christ. Very, very clear. And then Galatians. By the way, that's New Testament, isn't it? That is the New Testament, <laughs> and it's absolutely clear. Another passage, write this down. Galatians 6, 50, 15 and 16. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Paul calls the church the Israel of God. And he says, look, if you believe in Jesus, if you're born again and you believe in Jesus Christ, circumcision doesn't mean anything. You know, this, I used to be dispensational, I used to be a Pentecostal uh, preacher. And this whole idea, it's like God has two peoples, and the Jews are like first-class Christians, okay, and Gentiles are kind of second-class, and if you're a Jew, you're super great, and if you're a Gentile, you're kind of on a level. No, absolutely not. There is one people of God. All Christians who believe in Jesus Christ are of the seed of Abraham. They are the true Israel of God. Then turn, turn with me in your Bibles, write this passage down, Ephesians chapter 2, 14 and 16. 